you know, sort of top industrialized countries in the world, Israel is doing well, okay, has really done well in terms of testing mortality, total cases, total deaths. Um, however, if you look at what is happening to the curve, you'll see something troubling, which is what's upsetting myself and many of us, which is we had this thing licked it on the run just about two weeks ago. And all of a sudden, we are starting to see a spike and the second wave. Israel's always just a little bit ahead of the curve, and I wish we were not ahead of this curve. And everyone was talking about a second wave, can look to Israel to see what that looks like. And in fact, if you look just two weeks ago, May 25th, you'll see that we had no corona deaths for four days, and that our uh, new cases were down to five a day. And then if you look at today's headline, 228 in a day. Okay, we've gone from five to 228. The reason, by the way, is that we've opened up fully. We're all completely back to work, back to school, back to kindergarten, back to restaurants. I had a lovely celebratory dinner tonight with my family in a, in a restaurant. It's interesting, you know, because the new normal here is obviously with, with masks in restaurants, with uh, distancing between tables, your servers are with masks. They take your temperature on the way in. They force you to sanitize your hands. But the country loves the beach. We love shul. We love being together. We hug. And we are back on that ramp again. And it's really disturbing. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, just two nights, two days ago, the government announced that if we don't get our act together, we're probably headed to another series of restrictions just when we became free. So that's the overview of how we're doing that. Now, the reality is that this is not our collective first rodeo, right? Uh, pandemics are not new. We've had them for forever right? Uh, and just look in the last hundred years and you'll see a bunch of them. The unfortunate reality is this is not going to be our last rodeo either. This is just another one, perhaps one of the worst, if not the worst of the pandemics that we've experienced. And Israel is well suited to deal with this as startups. Because Israel today, not according to the ZOA or according to the Israeli embassy is the world's most innovative country. I mean, I used to have to show Zionist slides. Now I get to show Davos slides, okay? The people who put that, you know, elite conference on, they've decided that Israel is number one in the growth of innovative companies or number one in terms of attitudes towards entrepreneurial risk or number one in terms of entrepreneurial culture. Um, and if you look at what our funding for startups looked like uh, through the end of last year and even in this first quarter, uh, it was extraordinary, right? We were, last year we raised uh, $8.2 billion, if you look at that. And in the first quarter, we raised $2.7 billion. We were on track for a $10 billion year. Now, to put that amount of money in context, and this is money invested in Israeli startups. That is more than all of the U.S. military aid and all of the worldwide tzedakah and charitable contributions combined wow. by a long mark. And you realize that not only is this a lot of money and the largest source of foreign currency coming into Israel, but it is also the most impactful because it's giving birth and creating the startup nation. And what this results in, of course, is a ton of what we call exits, which are companies that are bought or go public, uh, resulting in tremendous profits, not just to the founders and the teams and even the hundreds, in some cases, of workers who have stock options, but also to smart investors, people who go to our crowd and other platforms and find a way to participate. Unfortunately, the reality has been, and this is the great Shonda 
and shame of our people is that the Jewish money, as defined by Jewish foundations, Jewish organizations, organized Jewish money is not part of this at all. It turns out that of all of the Jewish foundation money in endowments in federations in America, less than 1% has been invested in Israel. So when we think about what our Zionist agenda is and should be, it continues and needs to be a political agenda. It needs to be a social agenda. It needs to be an Aliyah agenda, which will be you know, increasingly strong. But we need to make sure that our Jewish organizations remember that the priority or one of the priorities has to be to continue to support that startup nation, that the funding needs to continue to flow to these incredible companies. So unfortunately, the startup world has been hit by the corona hard. Now this again is data from a couple of weeks ago and markets are back. It's amazing, NASDAQ is higher than it was before the crisis. But there has been a real hit to the startup world because startups and investors in startups generally don't like these kinds of crises. So Bloomberg shows it down by 50%. Here's the constituents of that barometer. The, the worst part has been simply first financings. Typical venture investors are not putting money into the very early stages of companies like the ones you'll hear about in a second from me or from Sanofi shortly, the way that they were. And that's a problem. And if this continues and affects Israel as it will, that's a problem. And so we have to respond, okay, to make sure that this story goes forward. And uh, what we're worried about is what has happened in the prior two crises. You look at how the numbers went down in venture capital. They went down considerably in the prior crisis of 2000, 2008, except the unemployment rate never got quite to what it is today. Now, the re recent job numbers in the States were encouraging, but still, we don't know exactly what these numbers are going to look like, right. ultimately, in terms of the, the drops. Now, in terms of what we believe in terms of uh, uh, recovery scenarios, people obviously realize that the V is preferable. Uh, U is sort of problematic because it stays low for a while. W is scary, the waves, and L is dreaded, okay, because that means we stay underwater a long time. We believe in a Y-shaped recovery. They say, I don't see a Y. Well, you got to turn your head sideways like this, and you'll see that Y. And what the Y is all about... a shin recovery. <laughs> right, that's a shin recovery. Very good. Sort of an artistic shin. Uh, and this recovery is basically a two-track recovery because there are two economies at work here. There is the fast V, which is the digital economy. The, country, the companies like Amazon or Zoom are doing unbelievably. And the other digital companies have had, the, had any hit at all have recovered, as I'll show you in a second. But many parts of the traditional economy, travel, hospitality, uh, you know, shared working spaces, commercial real estate, they are going to have more of a U recovery, hence the Y. And you can see this, again, I have not updated this for a couple of weeks, should and will do, but you'll see the, the FANG, which is the Facebook, uh, uh, Amazon, Apple, Netflix and Google has recovered like that uh, famous V. They came right back and then some. They're up. Whereas the rest of the economy, the S&P 500, at least as of this date, we're looking more U-ish, if you will. And uh, uh, let's talk about trends and then we'll get right into these companies and turn it over to some questions and then our, our second presentation. Look, the, the reality is that uh, what's happening now is not just the way that prior uh, market downturns were, like in 2000 and 2009. We're also seeing a civilizational shift 
an inflection point where new trends that were obvious, at least to me and to other venture investors, e-commerce, work from home, uh, distance learning, robotic process automation, these things have now entered hyper warp. Okay, in the last, according to Satya Nadella, in two months, we saw two years of digital transformation. So this provides a really interesting entry point for investors who are not just investing in a cheaper asset than it once was because of the downward pressure on venture prices, but they're also able to jump on these new mega trends. And if you doubt that there are mega trends afoot, just look at what Twitter and Facebook are telling their workers about the future of their office, which is stay home. Now, we're gonna be investing in this new pandemic innovation fund that we announced to quite a lot of international attention in these kinds of areas, in the vaccine and therapeutics and diagnostics, as well as the new normal, areas that really are getting that kind of digital transformation. And there are gonna be winners and there are gonna be losers and others that are sort of resetting their uh, reality. It's all going to be driven by AI or artificial intelligence, which luckily is Israel's strong suit. And so therefore, you have a ton of new technologies that have been announced and will continue to be announced in Israel, whether it's saliva tests and breathalyzer tests. It's a new test, by the way, that will actually do this not in under a minute and 20 seconds. Can you imagine being able to go to a sporting event or a nightclub? use the breathalyzer and 20 seconds later, yes or no, you know whether you're infected, that's coming. Okay, also new therapeutics, which are really ranging from stem cells to a bunch of others. Ventilators, you know, <laughs> that middle contraption looks a little scary, but it's amazing what Israeli ingenuity has done unleashed on this. And of course, vaccine development, there's now six different vaccine programs in Israel, uh, which is unreal when you think about it, when there are about 130 worldwide, six of them are in Israel. That's a pretty good percentage uh, for the world number. And we're investing in what we think is the leading candidate called MIGVAX. We announced a $12 million investment through our crowd. It's available on ourcrowd.com. And this company developed their virus as a result of four years of research into chicken viruses. Would you believe they were asked by the government of Israel up north in Migal, which is an institute uh, in Kiryat Shmona, to tackle this virus at attacking Israel's chickens, which are important. And they managed to develop a successful vaccine. Turns out the virus that bothered the chickens was a coronavirus, a different kind of coronavirus, but quite similar to the human novel coronavirus they're all fighting now. And they have now modified their bioinformatic tools. They've designed a new vaccine, and we hope in a few weeks, literally, to be in human testing. So this is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Site Diagnostics is a company which is using literally two drops of your blood, which you get from a pinprick, and I can tell you that I've done this test, and within 10 minutes, you have a full CBC or complete blood count. It's, there was that other company, I won't mention its name, that promised it could do it, turned out to be a big fraud. This one has been cleared by the FBA, which is nice to know. Uh, and partnered with a lot of uh, medical centers during the crisis in order to provide non-centralized lab testing facilities in quarantine and elsewhere. POM1 is allowing lung function testing to go on at your local doctor's office, point of care, on the desktop. And unfortunately, we know that many of the survivors of COVID-19 will have lung impairment. And in order to test this and to characterize this and diagnose and recommend treatment, you need this kind of a machine called POM1. TidoCare is one of the leading companies. And these, by the way, are all companies that are part of our platform. There are hundreds of corona companies in Israel. You can find many of them 
on a part of the website of Startup Nation Central, which is a great organization. They have a, a portal listing them. You can go to our site and find a lot of the materials, but I'm giving you a selection here. TitoCare is a leader in what we call telemedicine or remote diagnosis. So at this time, what they're using is a high quality video and graphics, automated AI docking, would you believe? So this woman is putting something in her daughter's ear quite fearlessly. Why? Because this thing is telling you where to put it, when to stop, and then takes that data, sends it on either live to a doctor or to an AI for diagnosis. And this was being used quite regularly to give real-time uh, data from corona patients who were sheltering you know, in their homes and and whatnot, and it does not just ears, it does nose, it does throat, and it does heart as well as lung sounds. Quite in a remarkable set of materials with TitoCare. Cryon is a company that does, what, again, this RPA, the robotic process automation, that allows bots to write your software. So the two largest healthcare organizations in Israel, Maccabi and Kalit, both wanted to hook up the emerging corona data uh, from their patients into their central databases, except that their software programmers told them it would take probably two to three months to get it done, fully tested. They didn't have two to three months. They needed it now. So these guys called in the bots, and they let the bots work on Shabbos, would you believe? <laughs> and within 48 hours, this was done, and uh, quite, quite exciting technology which made a lot of press. Intuition Robotics makes a bigger bot uh, called LEQ, which is a digital companion for the elderly. It's not like uh, Alexa or uh, you know uh, uh, Siri, because if you've seen a 90-year-old try to talk to those two, they don't have a good conversation. Uh, this, this allows you to talk in whatever way you'd like, and it understands you. It's intuitive, and it's designed to keep you connected, to remind you to take your meds, to uh, remember to take your temperature. And during this terrible loneliness, which affected so many of our elderly people, became a very, very important tool. MEMED is one of the leaders in early diagnosis of the virus, and in particular, just a few days ago announced that it got approval from the FDA for its immediate few minute test, which tells whether you have a virus or you have a bacterial infection. It's quite amazing. VocalZoom does a sensor array for airports that are reopening, allowing its unbelievable, very sensitive vibration sensor to measure your heart rate without having to touch you as well as temperature and a whole bunch of other critical data. Switch lets you manage the COVID disease as well as other diseases from your cell phone. It was originally developed for uh, diabetes and then later oncology. Now they've switched to add the uh, 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 COVID and it's really teaching us that our most important medical device is that phone in our pockets. Barcode Diagnostics is a diagnostic company that is actually encapsulating uh, for chemo patients um, the candidates that your doctor wants to try on you. And you basically get injected with these three or four candidates. And within two or three days, they do a liquid biopsy and tell you which one's working. Now they're using that same technology to encapsulate the mRNA that are being taken and analyzed in these PCR tests. And by adding a bunch of them together and then testing them all at once at the end, they're getting about a hundred fold uh, acceleration of these test results. And it's pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Texi is using your cell phone to let your technician help you without coming into your home. So Verizon, during the middle of the crisis, announced that they were adopting this, and their technicians were all using Texi to make sure that your internet or your TV was up and running. It works for washing machines and even works for ventilators. 
so that people who were keeping these critical pieces of equipment working didn't need to be in situ. Cyber MDX is working overtime, keeping the hackers at bay, because we've got to worry now about all of these guys who are targeting medical devices. And unfortunately, the reality soon is going to be that people are going to get ransom notices that said, we've got your pacemaker, we've got your vent, we've got your infusion pump, and you've got 30 minutes to live unless you send this money, usually to this foreign bank account. And Cyber MDX is working hard on preventing this nightmare from happening. They just raised $20 million. Sense Education is doing distance learning, but allowing you to actually do essay questions or computer code questions. A billion and a half students were out of school, many of them still out of school. And distance learning has become all the rage, but we got to test them too. And it turns out that uh, multiple choice and true and false don't, don't hack it enough for really testing students. So that's my presentation tonight. Thank you for listening. If you would like a copy of these slides, simply write me at webinar at rcrowd.com. We'll shoot you out a copy of these slides. Go to rcrowd.com, the website, sign up, take a look at our active deals, join us in building the startup nation. I would be happy to take a few of your questions, Steve, and then we'll turn over to the smart people from Synovia. Jonathan, thank you. That was just, that was wonderful. I wonder if you could uh, describe what drives the Israeli culture to innovate and, and come up with these, these <laughs> miracles, uh, devices, treatments, diagnostic uh, items. What is it about the Israeli culture that is, you know, you said there's hundreds of these companies. What, what drives okay. it? First of all, it's Jewish culture. I mean, let's face it, you know, there's a debate in the Torah and the Chazal, <coughs> the oral Torah, about why did God choose the Jews, okay, to get the Torah. And it's, uh, one guy says, look, you know, Azinhen, they're daring. And the other one says, no, not Azinhen, Chatsufinhen, they're Chutzpahdik. Okay, we are full of chutzpah. We are cheeky. We question authority. It's a strange tradition we have. Where on the one hand, we're supposed to be slaves to God and, and uh, follow rules. And on the other hand, we are rule breakers of the, of the worst or the best kind. And when you combine that with the unique culture of Israel's armed forces, with the pioneering ethos, with the fact that we are an immigrant society, that we're connected to the world in a global way like almost no other country. And we are mission-driven. I mean, you know, according to Jewish tradition, we're supposed to be working with God and partners in creation, right? The world's not fixed yet. We got to do it. And so all of these uh, uh, factors and more are at work in Israel, at work in Jewish people in general. But if Israel was a slouch, at business, that would be surprising, right? If the Jewish nation wasn't doing this, our Jewish people and our friends would be the ones who'd be the most surprised. Uh, second question, what do these, these advances and these devices and these treatments do to the BDS movement? Do they kind of explode that and make it, make it even more of a, uh, of a, a joke? A joke yeah, thank you. You think? I mean, look, I, I think that boycotts are not a, a, a laughing matter, except these people are pathetic, okay? Uh, most of them, even before the crisis, were living in their parents' basements, okay? These are people without lives, okay? They are uh, just a despicable, stupid bunch of idiots, okay? I, I love watching the Iranians and the BDS people sort of twisting, you know, on a skewer now about the, the vaccine, you know, that uh, Barghouti, the head of BDS, was asked, well, you know, you're into boycotting Israeli products. Yes, yes. Okay. What about if the Israelis get the, the vaccine first? Well, we'll take it. <laughs> okay. you know, we'll, we'll take it only so far. Now, you know, the Iranian government has redoubled their efforts, so they say, to boycott Israeli products. Good luck with that. You know, throwing away your cell phone, never using the internet, 
uh, you know, not going on any kind of search. I mean, it, it's absurd. Okay, BDS doesn't work. Ever since they established it, investment in Israeli technology has only gone up. And unfortunately, there are a bunch of fools, you know, who are mostly associated with, you know, crazy uh, uh, departments in what pose to be institutions of higher learning in a few of uh, United States or European locations, and some really bad has-been singers like Roger Waters. But the reality is that BDS is just so much noise. In Hebrew, there's a phrase, you know, klavim nofchim v'ashaya overet, the dogs bark and the, pa- and the caravan moves on. And we're the caravan, brother. We are moving on, and this BDS is just you know, just a, a, a horrible, bad joke, in my opinion. One more question. Uh, this is from one somebody in the audience, Harry Skidmore, wants to know, uh, he sees a lot of in- innovation in general. Uh, what about the human factor in all this? Are, are the robots, uh, I guess he's asking, are the robots going to take Oof. over? Are the robots going to take over and replace us? Yeah. Well, let's, let's hope that in some of the foolish things, yes, because, you know, for example, many, many, States and countries struggled with the onslaught of new uh, applications for for help and unemployment, right? And the reason they did was because most of them literally have to enter this stuff by hand. Hundreds and thousands of data entry people couldn't handle this onslaught. But that company I showed you crying on, they let bots do it. There is no stopping that, okay? The, the, don't have your child be a data entry person, okay? <laughs> That's not going to work anymore, okay? The robots are coming. And this is good news because we are creative people. Humans are creative. So if you look at what, who's been hurt the most by this crisis and will be hurt on a long-term basis, it's the low-paid manual laborers that this is where the disruption is going to happen. And there is no stopping this, okay? And we we can't legislate against progress. Now, the good news is that Israel is a change agent, an agent of disruption. And we have to make sure that our people are trained so that they're not going to do these kind of menial, you know, sort of lifeless jobs. We have to be people who are creating, okay? And that is our future. That is the future for America, the future for Israel, the future for all advanced societies. And that's true, by the way, in the farm field. We have a company called Tevel, who is using robotic drones to pick fruit because there's a worldwide shortage of hands, not just during COVID, but before to pick this fruit. That's the future. It's happening on the factory floor. It's happening in the coding rooms. It's going to happen everywhere. So sorry, guys, you know, being nostalgic isn't working. We got to get with the program. The good news is Israel is the most innovative country in the world. Invest your money in it. Invest your time and help us get that story out. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to catch some sleep now at about 2.30 a.m. here in Israel. And I want to say Yesher Koach to the ZOA for your fine work. Please continue doing the wonderful things you do. God bless you and lead throughout from Jerusalem. Jonathan, thank you very much. God bless you. May you go from strength to strength. Oh, uh, really an honor to have you. Jonathan Medved from our crowd. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And now I want to uh, welcome our president of Greater Philadelphia Chapter of ZOA, Kevin Ross, to uh, welcome people to the second half of our presentation. Kevin, you with us? Kevin? Kevin is not here. He was here. Maybe he'll be back. So we're going to get to our our second uh, half of the webinar right now. Uh, But before I do, I just want to mention uh, that after the event, if you uh, go to our website or the National ZOA website, and I'll put up the information shortly, uh, please make a donation. We need your support right now. Uh, obviously, times uh, are not normal, 
And part of the abnormality has been a, a drop in donations to support our vital work. So please go to our website. And again, I'll have it up on the screen uh, after our second speaker and make a donation. Uh, and now without further ado, we're gonna get to our next speaker, who is Andrew Shulman. Andrew is a Tamid Fellow uh, at Synovia, which is a company that's doing wonderful things, including uh, a, a new fangled mask. And joining him is his colleague, Alec Kennis, and also a Tamid Fellow uh, to talk about the uh, innovations at Synovia. Uh, young men, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. No, no, Hello, Steve, my dad is Mr. Feldman. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. Um, it's so good to see everybody. Well, first and foremost, I'm a former Eagles fan, but um, okay. me, and my, me and my colleague were to meet fellows, and we currently run this Novia USA team. So we're the heads of the USA department um, at Sonovia. So um, I can let my colleague introduce himself real quick. Hello. Time, time out one second. I see Kevin is here, uh, and we're going to have uh, just a word from our uh, our president. Kevin, are you with us? I see his name, but I don't see or hear him. Kevin? That's weird, because I, I see him, but I don't see him. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Andrew. Go ahead. Oh, it's not a problem at all. Um, so uh, I'm, an, I'm a student at Emory University. I'm majoring in finance and computer science. Um, and me and my colleague, we head the USA team at Synovia. And now off to my colleague to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. I'm Alec. I'm a Tamid fellow, and I'm an incoming junior at Harvard University. And I'm majoring in economics and social studies. And I, I was matched with Synovia for the summer as an intern. Um, and now I'm heading the USA team for the, uh, for the coming months. And so me and Andrew together are um, working together. We'll be presenting to you guys information about our company and about our revolutionary new technology. Time out, gentlemen. My, my president is back. I, he may be having Wonderful. some technical problems. Kevin, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome uh, to our event. Kevin Ross is, is our president of Greater Philadelphia ZOA. Uh, you'd like to say a few words, Kevin? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, that was, that presentation was amazing and, uh, and just so inspiring. And I, I really think we need to work on getting more uh, Jewish support for Israeli innovation. I, I was really shocked that it was less than 1%. That statistic really, really shook me. Um, but I, I'm just so impressed, uh, both at the presentation and the, the ongoing innovation going on in Israel. So uh, bravo, an excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. And we're going to hear from two more people uh, with an incredible presentation about uh, a wonderful product, it seems. Uh, gentlemen, continue. I apologize. Oh, um, thank yeah, you, Steve. Wonderful. So, oh, one second here. Let me get this. Um, up and running real quick. And I just want to add while you're doing it, we're not, we are not endorsing these companies, these businesses. We're just letting uh, the public and the community know some of the developments and innovations in Israel. This is not a, an endorsement from uh, ZOA or Greater Philadelphia ZOA. Just want to be clear about that. Go Wait, ahead, Andrew. Thank you. So you might be wondering what Synovia is. Well, at Synovia, we've designed a new way to use ultrasonic caviation to impregnate cloth masks with a zinc ion. Now, why is zinc ion? Zinc is a natural antibiotic or a natural antibiologic. So what this means is that when any sort of microbe lands on our mask, it, the zinc in the mask will denature the lipids of the virus, of the bacteria, of the fungi, rendering it in unusable and, and alive. Now, what does and, that mean for us lay people, denature the, the lipids? Right, of course. So it sounds like from Star lipids. Trek. So it basically just means that the outer layer of the virus or the outer layer of the bacteria will start to deteriorate when in contact with the zinc ion. There are several other kind of antibiologics, but we at Synovia chose zinc purely due to safety reasons and to the convenience and the price. Some other masks um, have tried to use something like silver, but the problem is silver will start to irritate the face and it's generally not healthy. Whereas zinc is a common additive in food, so it's completely safe. Zinc itself is FDA approved. 
And so it's completely safe to be worn, to be inhaled, or to be um, eaten within your food. Yeah. So, now let's do it. Okay. so essentially, we just, um, we originally, so we just developed a fabric, and essentially, and essentially what this fabric does is it kills bacteria, and it kills viruses, and it even kills fungi, it's anti-odor, and, um, and we've adapted this fabric, which, which we can use, you know, for hospital gowns, bed sheets, but we've, for, corona, for the COVID-19 outbreak, we've adapted it specifically to face masks. And so our face masks, they kill viruses, they kill bacteria. And then the best part about it is that because, we, like Andrew was saying, because we actually infuse these molecules, these ions into the mask fabric, it is rewashable. And so you can wash it up to 100 times at 75 degrees Celsius, and the masks will still work. And so... Um, and what, and do you wash it, what do you wash it in? You can walk in the washing machine, just like, just like your clothes, just throw it in there. And, and so that's the, that's the best part about them. And then they work through the processes like Andrew was talking about. Um, okay. Yeah, exactly what Andrew was saying. Well, this slide looks a little messed up or it's my eyes. I don't know. I think it's a slide though. Oh, do you see it? It's called um, the- Kind of curving. Is everybody, I don't know if everybody can see it curving like that, but okay. Oh, apologies. It's all uh, we can do without the sign. Right, it's curved. It is curved. Yeah, it's the whole page is. Okay, we we see it, but thank you. Okay, of course. Um, so we can just stop sharing. So basically, what we've tried to do at Synovia is create a general mask for the population to address several problems that we at Synovia saw. Um, was occurring within the general use of masks today. So currently, if you were to go on public, say you were to venture off into Target, which nowadays is like going to Puerto Rico or going to the Bahamas for a weekend. So if you were to go down to Target, you would see many people wearing simple cloth masks or wearing N95 style masks. Now, what is the problem with these cloth masks or what is the problem with these N95 masks? Well, the big thing is what they filter. So the Sona mask is unique in its properties because it filters both inhalations when you're breathing in air and exhalations when you're exhaling air. So the most common mask that people use today was just a general cloth mask. Now cloth masks are great for protecting the spread of coronavirus and the spread of other viral infections because they stop the velocity of droplets leaving your mouth and leaving your nose, meaning that you're not able to infect others as easily as if you didn't wear the mask. The problem though lies in the fact that the mask doesn't protect the user. So where wearing a cloth mask, you are protected from other people spreading the virus to you. You're only protecting others. Now, some might try to solve this problem with an N95 mask. But what's the problem with an N95 mask? Well, opposed to the popular belief, the N95 is not actually a mask. It's a respirator. Now, what does this mean when I say respirator? It means that it has a valve. So what the valves do is they allow exhalations to pass through the mask completely unfiltered. And so when you wear an N95 or similar style mask with a respirator, you're not protecting those around you. Now, this is a big issue with something like a coronavirus in a pandemic, because the biggest thing is not to worry about protecting yourself as much as it's to worry about not protecting others. Because one person, a one asymptomatic carrier can infect a whole lot of people without even knowing. So at Sunova, we've decided to fix this problem by inventing a mask that filters both inhalations and exhalations. Some features of our Sona mask are, we have a 98% filtration rate at five microns. Now, um, as part of the Sona USA team, one of the biggest questions that we get is, does your mask filter like the N95? Well, the short answer to this is yes, but the long answer is no, not exactly. So what do I mean by this? So the most common thing is that the coronavirus is around 0.3 microns. And while a five micron mask might not seem at first like it would block uh, the coronavirus, the WHO released several reports stating that the coronavirus needs droplets of five microns. And so we're not worried about actually blocking the coronavirus itself, which is a very hard, almost impossible task at three microns without something like a full gas mask. Rather, we capture the droplets and allow the virus to come in contact with our treated soft, with our treated fabrics. And so, so, in, so in other words, it it traps it like some of the other masks, but it also kills it. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. And so the killing part is one it's of the- double, double action. Double action. It traps it and it kills it. That's it. So something really important about the, this actual killing aspect or this denaturing aspect 
is it prevents a user from becoming infected when they touch their mask and then remove their mask and touch something like their eyes or their nose. A big problem is that if a mask were to catch a droplet and you were to touch that droplet, you could potentially touch your eyes or touch your nose or your mouth and transmit the virus to yourself. Now, there are several other masks, like I stated, which are also antiviral that use something like copper or silver. But one of the biggest, um, the biggest bonuses of our patent technology, patent technology, where we use bubble implosion to impregnate the fabrics, is that it gives our mask long, like, long lasting longevity. And so our masks are able to be washed up to 100 times at around 75 degrees Celsius and still maintain their antiviral effectiveness. Now, Andrew, how is the breathability? I mean, I, I've been walking around with one of these surgeon type masks uh, and sometimes, especially on a hot day, it's a little tough. How is, how is uh, the mask from Synovia with regard to, you know, comfort, breathability? Right, so one of the best things I spoke about earlier with our five micron filtration is that we're able to achieve a high breathability unlike other masks. So with something like an N95 mask, and um, excuse me for going back to the comparison, but right, the filtration is so small that they need a valve in order to allow air to exhale. Whereas ours, because it's larger, because it's designed to protect droplets, we're actually able to pass air through and into the mask completely breathable. I've had my mask and I've worn it for um, hours on end when I go to go shopping for my kosher uh, chicken whenever I want to make Shabbat dinner. And it works quite well um, in terms of breathability. There's no big CO2 buildup. A lot of times I'd wear a mask, like a normal cloth mask, and eventually you start to feel a little bit woozy or a little bit hot because you're just breathing in your own CO2. It's like if you were to be trapped in a small space. Our mask really works to prevent this by allowing the CO2 to kind of pass through freely. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you know when the mask is expired? You said it can be washed up to 100 times. How do you know when it's still working or if it's not still working? Right, that's a really good question. And I think the best part about this question is that so far, we haven't had any masks expire. Now we've been a company for several months now, but the lifespan of our masks are over one year. So you have over 1,080 hours of wear because we recommend washing after every 12 hours. And so currently at the point, we've haven't, we haven't had a problem where people are complaining about their masks expiring. The best thing that we recommend is just to keep track of when you purchase your mask and to repurchase after a year. But um, if Hashem uh, wills it, we're not going to be able to like, need masks after a whole year. So we hope to get to that point. Now, does your, what else does your company do with these, this fabric, this special fabric, uh, in addition to masks? Are there other uh, health uh, uses? Right. I'm so glad you asked. So currently, we only work with masks. And in the future, we hope to actually use our technology to create fabrics for hospitals and fabrics for other medical places. Whoa, who's uh, doing that here? Okay, okay, go on. And so what we hope to do is to create fabrics that will be able to be used in hospitals and used in other medical facilities where they need some kind of antiviral and antimicrobial protection. Currently, we are one of the leading fabrics to be able to treat and to defend against hospital-acquired infections, which are a big problem even before coronavirus. Now, this was developed in, in Israel, uh, and what is the connection between Synovia and, and bar -Alan? That's That's where this originated, is that correct? Yes, of course. So bar -Alan holds two of our patents. Um, most of our founders came from either bar -Alan University or IDC Herzl, and so we have a big connection to Israeli schools. We've actually been in contact with IDC Herzl, and we've been in contact with some other universities just to kind of try to market our mask and introduce our mask to them. Um, something else I would like to touch on is it's a really it's an advancement and that me and one of my colleagues on the Israel team are heading. We're actually starting to move into the African market. Now, something that is really unique about our mask is that our textile machine, unlike other textile machines, replaces the padding process. And so for those of you, which I'm sure, you know, I'm definitely no expert on textile processes, but those of you who aren't aware of what a padding machine is, um, which I mean, I mean who, who knows what a padding machine is exactly? I have so, one in my basement. No oh, wonderful, me too. So, in, at the start of a textile process, when you're finally getting the fabrics and treating the fabrics, a padding machine would go and it would take, it's called a liquor, and I know it's really exciting, but it's just a bunch of chemicals that basically coat the mask um, near the beginning of the textile process. 
our machine actually replaces the padding process. So we cut down on the chemicals used on the chemistry in a textile process by around 50 to 80%. And we actually replace this machine in filter treated fabrics. And so what this does is it allows our machines to kind of be inserted into any kind of textile process for textile mill with a relatively cheaply cost because all they have to do is replace their padding machine. And so what we started to do with this is we've, got, we've gone in contact with several African countries. We're hoping to market our masks there at a price that they're able to work with. Currently, we sell something called a mask kit. And a mask kit is basically a disassembled mask with a fabric. And we're selling it at um, an incredibly slash price in order to get the mask to places where they need it most. A lot of these places in Africa, such as Nigeria, right? We see over here, at, um, like in our hometown, like the coronavirus is raging and it's like massive and here it is. Well, it hasn't, it's yet to hit many of these places and the big wave is yet to come. Just because... Let me ask you, because we're running uh, short on time, is, is your mask being worn and used a lot in Israel? I mean, where, where it was invented? Yeah, we, we, um, actually really funnily is one of our advising board members actually sent us a picture of someone she ran into wearing the mask. Um, at the um, NYC Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, they have a wonderful photo of uh, a woman standing next to Governor Cuomo wearing, the, wearing our Sona mask. And so we see this mask being worn all the time and we think it's a really great way to curb the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Real quick question for you and your colleague. Uh, you're young guys, a lot of young people have been taken in by the BDS cult. How do you see this mask, this product uh, as, uh, as uh, eradicating BDS, if you will, especially among people your age? Right, so the whole thing about eradicating BDS with our mask is that we hope to get to a point um, together with other Israeli mask producers, because don't there are several, like Argoman, and we have incredible respect for it. We hope that, that together with them and other Israeli companies, we will be able to flood the medical market with so many great innovations, innovations that will take everybody by storm to a point where the BDS movement won't have a choice but to accept their mask. I mean, at the end of the day, right, would you rather, you, you have to pose this question to members of BDS. Would you rather oppose Israel so much that you risk putting other people's lives in danger because you don't want to use an adequate mask? Or will you go, are you going to accept Israeli innovations and accept the fact that we're all a peaceful nation. We all want to live in shalom. We all want to live in peace and coexist, right? And so are you going to accept that fact and kind of help support us and in turn help support them and create and foster a, a climate of peace and unity? And I think this is especially important at a school like Emory where we recently had a fake eviction notices where members of our like BDS movement went around and posted eviction notices on our doors. And as a member of EPAC myself, which is our Emory Israel Political Action Committee, you know, we're really strong in the fight against BDS and we hope that you will join us. Now, real quickly, if anyone has um, any questions, feel free to visit us at synoviatech.com. And if you click that little um, Facebook messenger bubble, you'll talk to either me or Alec. We're gonna take a couple questions, folks. If you go where it says participants and click on that, there's an option to raise your hand. And we've got time for maybe one or two questions if you make the questions brief and the answers brief. And meanwhile, I'm gonna put up a couple of slides uh, from PowerPoint. Let's see. So here's our contact information while people are queuing up. If you want to uh, donate to us, find hand. us on, I'm sorry. If you want to donate to us, find us on the web. Uh, it's info at zoa.org and nationally it's uh, www.zoa.org and locally it's office at zoaphilly.org and www.philly.zoa.org. Please make a contribution if you can. And also we are looking for sponsorships. If you'd like to sponsor one of our virtual programs and help us reach people during the pandemic and and going forward, please contact us at our Greater Philadelphia office. The number is 610-660-9466. And coming up on the ZOA Zoom network, uh, Wednesday, that's tomorrow, June 10th at 7 p.m., Dispelling Lies and Myths Coming from Israel, featuring Matan Peleg and Doug Altebef of Im Tirzu, which is a wonderful 
Zionist NGO based in Israel. And Thursday at uh, 1 p.m., my colleague uh, Liz Burney is going to be uh, doing a book club event featuring uh, Josh London on uh, Victory in Tripoli, How America's War with the Barbary Pirates Established the U.S. Navy and Shaped a Nation. And then coming up from Philadelphia ZOA next week, June 16th, Spotting Anti-Israel Materials and Curriculum in Schools, What You Can Do About It with Charles Jacobs and Ilya Feokadasov. And June 23rd, Know the Campus Dangers, if not now, J Street U and SJP and how they work with our campus coordinators. Uh, they'll be joining us. So upcoming great programs coming along. And uh, now we have a couple questions. Uh, Kevin, unmute yourself. Kevin Ross will take your question. Thank you. The, uh, I noticed that the, uh, that the uh, woman on the stock exchange was wearing the mask. And I'm wondering if there's a, a way for civilians to purchase the mask now. Is it available uh, online or is there some place where we can purchase the mask? Yeah, everything is available. If you look in the chat, there's a link. It's at zenobiatech.com. Everybody's more than welcome to purchase the mask and we offer free international shipping. Fantastic. No, I've sent the, you guys I've do it. the link to the chat so if everyone, everyone can see where you can get it. It's in the, it's in the chat right there. Okay. Uh, next, we'll take a question from Michael Goodman. Michael, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello. Uh, I was going to make a suggestion. Since you're looking at the market in Africa, I was going to suggest that you should look at Latin America as well, because they say that that's right now probably the next area that uh, will experience a severe spike in Corona-19. Thanks. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah. Um, several of my colleagues actually on the Israel team are looking into the South American market. We already have contacts in several countries and are really excited to kind of help people out in other countries, not just Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm. oh, we Any really other questions before we, uh, before we go? Uh, okay. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you, uh, Andrew and um, Alec. Alec. Alec and Andrew. Andrew right. and Alec. Thank you very much, you. young thank men, you. uh, for representing Sanofi tonight and telling us about uh, your company and your products. Bye. Thank you. Go Eagles. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and everybody else, please, again, please make a donation. These, these are times when uh, we need ZOA and the vital work that ZOA does that, that other organizations are not doing. And your donations are the fuel that, that gives us the, the ability and the strength to, to fight these battles, meet these challenges successfully. Uh, we've been very successful and hopefully we'll have more successes, but we need your support to be able to do it. So if you're in the greater Philadelphia area, please go to philly.zoa.org and donate. And if you're outside the Philly area, please go to zoa.org and donate. If you'd like to know about our upcoming programs, uh, email info at zoa.org. If you wanna know more about greater Philadelphia ZOA, email us at office at zoaphilly.org. I thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope to see all of you tomorrow for ZOA's next virtual event. And I wish everybody well and good health and a complete recovery to those who are not well. And have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.